Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I am really excited to welcome everyone this evening for a Capital Trails Coalition panel. Uh, this evening, we are focused on hearing about the many different health impacts of active transportation and recreation, especially multi-use trails. Um, we are joined by a very esteemed panel of folks from across the region um, who are focused on helping people get outside um, and get active through lots of different ways. Um, we're excited to dive into their work um, with lots of different questions. Um, before we get started, I wanted to provide folks with a quick overview of the Capital Trails Coalition. Uh, the Capital Trails Coalition um, is located here in the Washington, D.C. area. We're working across Northern Virginia, D.C. and the surrounding counties in Maryland to create um, a trail network for folks who are walking, biking, rolling, strolling, et cetera, um, across the region, making our region truly accessible, inclusive, um, and enjoyable for folks to be able to get around for transportation and for recreation. Our coalition is an organization of organizations. We're currently at um, more than 80 different government agencies, businesses, community groups, and local nonprofits, all working to activate those spaces and to continue to build out and improve our trail network. Um, today, we are excited to announce that our total trail network of planned and existing trails includes more than a thousand miles. Currently, we are at just over 51% complete. So we still have a couple hundred more miles to go in completing that network. But we know that once we complete that trail network, we will see significant impacts on the region um, that extend to our community's health, environment, economics, and more. Um, for example, um, when we complete the trail network, a study completed just a couple of years ago, showed that with an investment of 1.09 billion to complete the trail network and the capital trails network, we would see a total of 1.02 billion total in economic benefits every year. That includes 517 million in annual public health savings. In addition to lots of other um, benefits for health, environment, the environment, et cetera. Um, so without further ado, um, I want to turn it over to our great panelists today um, for each of them to introduce themselves, say a little bit about their organizations, and then we'll dive into some questions. Um, for folks who are joining us online, I um, encourage you to post your questions um, in the chat. We'll save some time at the end to get to them. And if we don't get to them, we'll follow up with you later. Um, so let's launch right into our introductions today. I'm really excited to be joined by Lauren, Kay, and Sarita. Um, let's start our introductions off with Lauren. Thanks, Callie. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Marr, and I am a public health analyst um, on the SNAP-Ed team at DC Health um, within the Community Health Administration. Um, so SNAP-Ed is the educational arm of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, also known as SNAP. Um, and our program works to reach SNAP eligible residents to provide um, nutrition and physical activity education. Um, and then we also work to improve the food and built environments in DC um, to make healthy choices more accessible for all residents. Um, and it's great to be here today. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Sarita, over to you. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for having me. I am Sarita, the founder of Collective Healing, which is a health and wellness community for women of color powered by sisterhood. Our mission is to reduce the mental, physical, economic, and social impact of chronic illness, disability, and disease for women of color by promoting kinship and centering traditional holistic healing practices. Awesome. Thanks, Rita. And Kay, over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Kay Rodriguez, and I am the founder and CEO of Outerly. We are building the tech-first social platform for outdoor recreation, helping to reduce barriers to outdoor recreation access, specifically in cities and large urban metropolitan areas, by helping people find other people to get outdoors with. Um, we learned that about 75% of people don't go outside as much as they would like to because they can't easily find somebody else 
to go with them. And so we are solving the problem of connectivity, specifically social connectivity um, with trails, parks, and waterways in greater metropolitan areas around the country and hopefully one day the world. Awesome. Well, I am already inspired just hearing a little bit more about each of your organizations. Um, but uh, while we are focusing so much on health, I know health is in the name of many of your organizations, but want to go around and hear more about how your organization is thinking about health. Specifically, what are the aspects of health that your organization focuses on, whether it's physical fitness, reducing anxiety and stress, building social relationships, addressing loneliness, etc. Um, so Lauren, turn it over to you. I would especially love to hear more about how the department is working on um, approach from the public health perspective. Yeah, definitely. Um, so SNAPBED, uh, we work to improve both um, nutrition and then um, I guess physical fitness, physical activity related health um, for residents. And we do this by working on multiple levels of influences on health. Um, so we have activities that impact um, individuals, um, various settings and other sectors besides um, public health. Um, so on the individual level, this mostly looks like providing nutrition and physical activity education to residents. Um, so that way they have the skills for healthy eating and physical activity. Um, and then these education efforts also reach um, individuals in a variety of different settings. So um, we work in the early care and education space, um, K through 12 schools, community centers, um, recreation centers, um, other food access sites, um, resident residential sites um, and food retail environments. Um, and we also have partners within these settings and we work with them to um, make environmental changes that are then more supportive of um, healthy choices. Um, and then we also partner with other government agencies to collect data um, that informs policymaking and also those um, changes to the food and built environments. Um, and so um, for us working on multiple levels, we can then both support skills for individuals, but also make the environment supportive of using those skills for everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Could you tell us a little bit more about the built environment efforts that you work on? Yeah, so um, for us, the as the health department, our main strength is um, data collection. So um, we really work in a more collaborative sense in the built environment. So we work with DPR and DDOT um, to support in like uh, the Department of Energy and Environment as well um, to support their data collection efforts um, and their direct work in the built environment. Awesome, thank you. All right, um, jumping over to Sarita. I know health and healing is in the name of your organization. Could you tell us more about your personal journey and how that informs your work um, thinking about this? Yes, yeah, so I really started collective healing out of my own need to be able to have a safe space to be able to connect with other women of color who are living the shared experience of navigating health, disability, and disease. I live with a invisible disability, chronic illness called fibromyalgia. Uh, and 20 years ago, uh, having access to uh, communities that will uh, help me to navigate the highs and lows of of the and ebbs and flows of living with this disease was few and far between. And I felt very isolated in many ways um, in navigating the healthcare uh, system, which at that point did not know much about fibromyalgia. Now you hear more and more people are being diagnosed. There are more and more uh, people that look like me, women of color who are navigating this illness. And there are avenues to be connected to other communities. And so my work is driven by my purpose. Um, and that purpose comes from my lived experience and also my professional experience as a social worker, having the privilege and honor of supporting communities that are often represented or underserved 
those who are unhoused, living with HIV AIDS, people who are living with intellectual disabilities or are living through intimate partner domestic violence. Well, thank you for your work. Um, Sarita, could you tell us a little bit more about how your work as you think about um, healing, uh, collective healing, how does that tie to being outdoors, especially making the outdoors more accessible? So we want to be able to provide our community members with the opportunity to understand the what nature can sort of help us do in terms of our own healing journey. Like nature can hold space for us in terms of providing a place to rest and restore. And genetically, you know, as people, we are wired to have more of a symbiotic relationship with nature as stewards of the land. And roughly, you know, the large majority of us we spend 90% of our time indoors. So we're very much far removed from this closeness to nature. Um, and so we have to be more intentional with receiving and experiencing the benefits of nature. So practices like for spading and grounding can also help uh, to reduce blood glucose levels for those who are navigating life with diabetes and also increase our body's own ability to produce and protect our immune systems. And so going back to our in intention is really to help our members to understand the health benefits of nature by making these nature-based experiences more accessible, safe, and welcoming to our community members who express those interests. And so we curate those experiences, whether it's specific to nature-based therapeutic therapy, trail walking, running, or biking, bird watching, landscape art, or horticulture, you know, for us to collectively explore and reclaim the experience of the healing power of nature. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Kay, in your overview of Outerly, you talked a little bit about how Outerly is helping to bring people together. Um, could you tell a little bit more about how you think about health in those activities um, and in just um, like how you came up with the idea for the app? Absolutely. I am a personal, I have personal experience with the ever burgeoning mental health crisis that we have, especially following the pandemic, um, as well as the loneliness epidemic that I think a lot of people are facing given some of the challenges that the pandemic brought about in our communities, especially urban communities. Um, I read a study recently and I, I don't remember who ran it, but DC is actually one of the loneliest cities in the country. And as a result in the world. Um, and I think that that comes from, as a result of a lot of factors. It's a very transient city. We have people coming in and out all the time. Um, we are a very work for focused um, city from a social standpoint. And so I think when it comes to making friends and making connections, it's really challenging, whether it's making a new friend group or having a community or a safe space where you can talk about the challenges that you're facing on a regular basis, all the way to things like professional networking, dating, et cetera. Ask anyone and it's always a challenge. Um, and so one of the things that we really wanted to focus on with Outerly was solving that problem specifically using the third space of our green spaces. Um, a lot of the loneliness epidemic literature and studies have talked about things um, about these third spaces that are going away, things like church and things like in-person classes and in-person working even um, in an office. And so now what we see is a lot of people have a lack of space that they can go and see the same faces or recreate or work alongside the same people. And so um, from kind of a holistic health perspective, our our focus is very much on the mental and social health of communities, especially the communities that we serve. Um, in terms of how the company got started, um, I moved to Chicago several years ago um, 
with a former partner of mine and I didn't know anybody in the city. Uh, we moved there for his job. I was kind of transplanted and dropped off in the city that I knew nobody knew nothing about. And when I asked people where to go outside, they I was met with, oh, honey, this is Chicago. This is not Colorado. We don't really do that stuff here. Let's go get a beer instead. And what I learned from that experience is that People have had this perception that cities are very separate from nature. Um, so instead of, I, I went and got beer with my friends, but instead of thinking, okay, well, I guess there's nothing here to do. I went on Google maps. I found a bunch of green patches on the maps and I made a list of places that I wanted to go. And I started to um, document my experiences on the internet. And um, after a few months, we had about 300,000 people reading my articles about places to go outside all across the country and the places that I lived and traveled in um, and realized that there was a huge opportunity here for people who live in cities to help them find places to go and help them find people to go with. So after lots and lots of customer research, we figured out, okay, well, we've got 75% of people who want to go outside, but don't have anybody to go with them. So they don't get to go outside as much as they want to. And as a result, the Outdoor Industry Association actually found that 45% of Americans do not participate in an outdoor activity at least once a year. A year. <laughs> um, and so that whole, the whole matrix of people to go with, places to go, cities versus nature, that all of those challenges inspired me and my team to create and build Outerly. Um, right now, we are uh, very much in the final stages of building our platforms. We will be out in the App Store and Google Play after lots and lots of testing um, in the next month. And um, our vision is truly to provide a space on the internet for these people to connect virtually so that they can go outside together in real life. Awesome. Thank you for that work. That is a very surprising statistic to me to imagine that 45% um, of folks are not able to get out once a year. Um, I think something that as we think about trails, especially in um, the metropolitan DC area, is what do people think of as outside? Um, and I think something that we have a real opportunity with the Capital Trails Network is to really emphasize that even in an urban environment, spending time on a trail can really give you um, some of those health benefits that maybe you're not out deep in the woods somewhere, but you can still be out um, being active and get some of those same benefits from being outside and helping you to identify like some of those um, opportunities to be outside, even if you're not considering yourself like out um, in, in nature, like outside is still good for you. Um, and just a personal aside there, but I'm really excited to think about how the Capital Trails Coalition, our network of trails can provide a really strong network for people to get outside and get together. All right. Yes, we'll and absolutely. Questions. If I could just add, Please. even just two hours a week can mm -hmm. make a tremendous impact on being outdoors. Um, all of what you mentioned even if it's sitting down in a local park, a small patch of green space that does tremendous uh, wonders to your overall health and well-being. Thank you. Well, I know we have lots of very strong advocates here. Um, well, building on that question, as we're thinking about um, how are we helping to get people outside, um, I would love to hear how um, organizations um, might be doing some intentional work, whether it's messaging or um, like where you might be holding programming to truly make, to truly help make outdoor spaces more accessible and more welcoming um, to people of all ages and abilities. Um, we'd love to hear if there are any specifics that come to mind. Um, maybe this time we'll, we'll switch up the order a little bit um, and we'll start with Kay this time. Yeah, um, I think that historically the outdoors, especially outdoor recreation, has had a reputation of being the most hardcore, the most epic, the most sandy, gnar experiences. And unfortunately, that has come across both in the 
communities that participate as well as the brands and organizations that market the outdoors to the consumer. And so as a result, uh, even in our research, um, talking to customers and surveying customers, we hear a lot of things like, oh, I'm not outdoorsy like that, or I, I'm not hardcore enough to do that, or um, this space isn't for me. And so even things, even words that are softer, like adventure or outdoors um, can feel intimidating to people. And so I think for us, we have rebranded from traditional hardcore, like get the hardest workout in, get scale the highest mountain type outdoor recreation to let's just get outside. To Sarita's point, I think there's there's tremendous benefits, uh, both physiological benefits as well as psychological benefits of getting outdoors regularly, consistently every single week, including cardiovascular, obesity, um, memory function, um, blood pressure, like all sorts of things that you may not nor, people may not equate to a benefit of being outdoors that studies have shown are actual benefits of spending regular time outdoors. But that means that we have to cultivate a group of people that go outdoors every single week, and we have to make the outdoors feel welcoming to them. So when we have outerly events, we don't call them outdoor events at all. We actually use the word fresh air because instead of it being like, we're going to walk really fast, we're going to we're going to do really intense things. We're going to go the longest route. We're just getting outside to talk to each other and to hang out and to enjoy the sunshine. It, no pressure. We don't leave people behind. And we we message all of this to people to make it seem like it's, it's almost like a satisfaction guarantee. It's like, this is a low stakes way for you to get outside. We're not going to leave you behind. We're not going to we're not going to make this experience feel intimidating to you. This is just a way to get people together and recreating, even in urban or like semi-urban trail systems. Um, and you still get those benefits of being in green spaces, moving alongside friends. And you will end up walking four to five miles sometimes and people don't even realize it. Um, and I think that as a result, um, we our, our programming and our proposition attracts a wide variety of people. I would say a lot of people think, oh, it's a tech company. It's meant for Gen Z and millennials completely. But actually, um, one of the fastest growing sectors in the outdoor industry is the uh, 55 plus sector. And so we get a lot of people who come out every single week with us who are in that demographic. Um, and so we have regulars who are 19 years old all the way to like 75. And it's incredible to see all of these different people who the barriers are lowering for them and the, the sort of stigma and stress of planning an outdoor activity is lowered for them. So they just feel comfortable showing up as themselves and being outside with other people. And so I think um, one last thing that I'll say before I hand it off is the, the name Outerly came from outdoors, but friendly. Um, and I think that really infuses everything that we do. We want we want to make the outdoors seem friendly to people and we want people to be able to get friendly with other people in these nature spaces. And so the core of everything that we do is really two components, outdoors, nature as one, and then friendship and community as the other. Thank you, Kay. All right, um, Lauren, uh, could you talk a little bit about how your work, especially um, how the department is thinking about addressing health inequities? Um, yeah, um, so for ours, um, we, as I mentioned, we do a lot of data collection. Um, and so part of that is when we're planning programs or we're planning projects, um, we're really deliberate with including residents um, in that process. And so um, we frequently host um, feedback sessions with um, residents and community-based organizations um, when planning things. And we really just go in wanting to understand community needs and then in wanting to be able to incorporate their input into our programming, um, especially because um, our residents and our community-based organizations are, are usually our end users of whatever program or project we're planning. And so 
um, having their input is essential to making sure whatever we put out is a welcoming and accessible um, resource for them. Um, and in terms of health inequities, um, well, the SNAP-Ed program, our target population is um, the SNAP-eligible population. And we know um, that the SNAP-eligible population um, is faces larger health disparities, especially um, around chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancer, um, diabetes, high blood pressure. Um, and so we, by working with um, that population or with our residents who are SNAP eligible um, and incorporating their feedback, we're really making sure that um, our programs are um, accessible and welcoming for them. And hopefully that in turn um, has makes them want to join our program or use our programs. And then hopefully um, the outdoors will be more welcoming and physical activity will be um, more welcoming as well. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Could you tell us a little bit about how you structure those um, public engagement um, opportunities? Yeah, so um, where we sit in the Department of Health, um, we, are in the same area that a lot of other food access programs um, are. So the Commodity Supplemental Food Program um, and the WIC program. Um, so a lot of times um, we are able to reach residents through those programs. Um, and so we will go, uh, we will either, they have like text messaging programs that we can kind of send out opportunities through um, or um, site leaders who um, work with residents as well can, um, spread the information. Um, and then a lot of times we have really strong connections with our um, community-based organizations. Um, so we also um, tend to lean on them to help um, advertise these engagement opportunities. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Well, Sarita, on to you. I know um, you had mentioned um, in your overview, thinking through lots of different opportunities that help people get outside. Um, could you talk more about kind of how you think about that menu of options and how having those different options um, creates opportunities for people to get engaged? Thank you. Uh, so really sort of adding on to what was thought thoughtfully shared by um, both Kay and Lauren, uh, really understanding the importance of engaging the community. Um, understanding what their needs are, their interests, barriers to access um, from obtaining these uh, experiences or really sort of helping to promote their own health and well-being and really creating partnership around the services that we provide based on interests and based on their needs. And if we are saying that, you know, it's accessible and safe, right? If that's our intention, what are the policies that we're putting in place in partnership in the working relationship that we have with the community to engage in these interventions, in these um, outdoor experiences for more effective change? And so our actions have to really sort of equal our intentions and really sort of really be explicit about what we mean in terms of all our welcome access to all uh, this is an inclusive space and um, understanding that language around that as Kay mentioned is very important um, sometimes language can deter people from feeling safe and comfortable to have these experiences Thank you. Yeah, really insightful. Like mean, we are trying to think about the messaging, who we're working with, how are we creating real relationships um, that help people make, help those spaces feel um, welcoming and accessible for everyone. Um, I really appreciate the work that each of your organizations are doing um, around that. Um, we kind of kicked off, and I know some of your personal stories have touched on this a little bit, but as we all saw um, during the pandemic, um, there were historic increases in the number of people who were getting outside for recreation, to walk, to bike, um, and more. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about how your organizations 
um, may have seen that. Um, and if you're seeing trends now and how you may be working to continue encouraging people um, to continue getting outside for active recreation and transportation. And this time um, we'll start with Sarita. Thank you. So we actually launched Collective Healing during the pandemic. So we are working as we evolve because most of our programming is virtual. So we're working to provide more opportunities for in-person experiences that connect us. Um, in the DMV area in New York, where it originally started, and working in collaboration with local holistic practitioners and outdoor adventure companies to curate outdoor healing experiences, really sort of, again, centering uh, traditional healing practices, building cultural relevance to, between outdoor spaces and communities, creating safety around gathering in the outdoors, because in a lot of um, communities of color, communities that are underrepresented by various different intersections, there is data of lived experience where there, you know, a lot of us don't feel safe being out in the outdoors just because of their own lived experiences or historical experiences of, around experiencing the outdoor space. And so really keeping that um, safety is the primary intention and making sure that we are really creating policies around keeping everyone safe. Thank you. Um, Kay, I know you talked about how your own experiences really led to the, the development um, of your company, of the app. I um, was wondering if you have seen um, any changes in how people are responding to those opportunities or um, or anything else that you've observed in those engagement trends. Yeah, when I, I moved to Chicago in 2019 and I started what became Outerly um, at that time, it was called Urban Outdoors. And in the early days of urban outdoors, we would get a lot of people who were already seasoned outdoor people. They'd either grown up with it or they had been recreating in the outdoors for a long time. Um, and that was generally speaking our main clientele of urban outdoors. As the pandemic hit and then continued on, we started to see a lot of new faces and I think the interesting thing about what we call the outdoor curious person is that they they come with a little bit of trepidation, but also a lot of excitement about the opportunity to be outdoors. And so um, I think following on with a lot of the conversation we had about language and about how words affect people's experience, um, I definitely started to pay more attention to what words were triggering what types of responses. Um, and I think, especially coming out of the pandemic, oh, there's a bit of a struggle actually to get people to stay on as these core consumers or core recreationist participants in the outdoor industry. So I think one of the strongest pro propositions of that and something it seems like everybody in this virtual room is working on is really making the outdoors less of a, I need to go plan a trip to a national park. I need to take two weeks of vacation, pack up my suitcases and my kids and my family and like fly them out somewhere crazy versus I'm going to go for two hours on a Saturday morning with my family to the nearby trail system um, or to the lake or um, take a day trip or something like that. And so I think the localization of outdoor recreation is a huge opportunity and one that we're that we started to see a lot of during the pandemic, but that remains to be um, an area of potential growth for 
for outdoor participants. And then also um, the opportunity to transition a lot of these once a year or once a month practitioners into these once a week practitioners or multiple times a week. Um, in a perfect world, 100% of people will go outside at least once a week. Um, and I think that's very aspirational, but I don't think that that's actually an impossible goal. And so from a North Star perspective, I think our two goals and um, like the two trends that we're really seeing and trying to work towards are first, like keeping the outdoor curious consumer interested in outdoor recreation by making it fun and making it social and making it low stakes. And then also taking the, the, occasional outdoor recreationist from occasional to regular. Um, and so I think that started in the pandemic and we saw a lot of that shape up. And so I think we we have a responsibility, but also a huge opportunity to continue taking advantage of that momentum that started and taking advantage of people's interest that got peaked when it was the only thing that they could do um, and creating lifelong practices, behaviors, and habits out of that. Well, we appreciate Outerly's help uh, to encourage people to build those connections and those habits. Um, Lauren, over to you, would love to hear um, how the department, the District Department of Health is thinking about um, maybe leveraging some of those trends of people getting up more outside um, or any trends that you have seen that can inform the work we're trying to do now? Yeah, um, so uh, disclaimer, I was not in this position during the pandemic, so I can't really speak to that. Um, but I know since I've been here, we've largely heard um, a need and a want for physical activity programming. Um, for now, we've we've largely been limited on our physical activity um, programs. Um, but we are, when we do hear someone asking for that, um, we typically point them um, to our community partners who offer that. Um, and we know about, um, but so yeah, currently we're more focused on nutrition education, but we are definitely working to grow our opportunities um, for physical activity education. Um, so for example, um, among our senior population, we hear a lot about um, being scared to get out and walk. And so we're starting a small walking program just with a couple of our sites um, to kind of see how that goes. Um, and if that is a success, then we're hoping to be able to scale it up um, to more sites eventually and reach more people. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, we do hear a need for physical activity and we're just kind of going baby steps at a time to kind of grow that. Well, Lauren, um, your comment about community partners, I think, is something that I've heard from each of these groups. Um, would love to hear more about how each of your groups is working with community partners. Um, and then after that, we'll go into a quick lightning round to wrap up our formal questions. And then I wanna open it up um, to the broader group. Um, so before the lightning round, um, would love to hear a little bit more from our panelists about how are you working with other organizations, community partners um, and others. So this time, um, let's go back to Lauren. Yeah, um, so the SNAPBED program, um, we have five uh, programs that we consider our grantees. Um, so we fund them to implement nutrition education um, and also physical activity. Um, and so then we also have an in-house um, nutrition educator who um, is also does nutrition and physical activity. Um, so through our community partners, um, we work with them um, directly through the SNAPED program, but then a lot of them also have other programs um, that are public health, um, either directly related or adjacent um, that we have just made connections by them being a SNAPED grantee um, and we can work with them that way. Um, additionally, the other food access programs that are housed in our department or um, with other government agencies, um, we've worked to develop good relationships with them. Um, and so the um, Commodity Supplemental Food Program, we work really closely um, with their site leaders. Um, and so with that program, um, this is a little more nutrition education related 
related, but we also um, have started physical activity programming with these sites as well. So um, the site leaders for the CSFP program, um, we work with them. So we have a nutrition educator who goes to those sites um, and tailors the programming to the foods that they receive. So that way um, they are then able to understand, okay, here's what I can do with the foods that I'm receiving. Um, and then with uh, that was a group that we largely heard a need for um, the walking program. And so now we're working with them to um, kind of combine the nutrition education as, uh, with the um, the walking component and then um, adding a third partner into that, trying to connect that with the farmer's markets as well. And so just kind of bringing like a, a workaround of uh, everyone collaborating together. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, bringing as many people, as many organizations together um, definitely makes sense. Um, Kay, uh, would love to hear how you're working with other organizations. Yeah, I think that our biggest opportunity with Outerly in our partner relationships at the moment is really visibility. Um, there's I, I think that there, there are a lot of opportunities for tech to integrate with community organizations, nonprofits government agencies, et cetera. Um, but right now, since we're so early stage, I think the biggest thing is being able to partner with organizations that are already doing the work of getting people outside and saying, hey, you all are doing amazing work and we don't want to take that from you or step on your toes or compete with that. We will actually want to pr provide the platform for those relationships to transcend simply like meeting once a month or however, however, whatever their cadence is, and also provide a digital space where anyone knows that they can go on there, they can find other outdoorsy people, they can ask questions in a safe, moderated space, they can um, find the right community for them to feel safe and welcome in the outdoors. Sometimes that is a person just going to a meetup type event where you could have any type of person there and some people thrive in that type of environment. Some of that is a lot more affinity focused. And so um, an example of this is we are doing a joint Earth Day walk on April 21st with City Girls Who Walk DC. It's going to be an urban trail walk. Um, any female or non-binary person is welcome to join us at that event. And um, the purpose of that event is to tap into the City Girls Who Walk DC community so that they know, hey, if you enjoy doing this and you enjoy coming to these walks, there's a whole ecosystem of these things that are going on all around you in DC and you can find them all in one place on Outerly. Um, and so we're really leveraging these community partnerships to gain more visibility, not just for us, but for people who we partner, organizations that we partner with and the people that belong to those organizations so that we can cultivate this ecosystem digitally on our platform. Thanks, Kay. Um, Sarita, over to you. How are you thinking about some of those community partnerships in your work? So we believe that healing doesn't occur in isolation. It's an act of communion, uh, a, a beautiful, a quote from Bell, the late Bell Hooks book, All About Love. And so since our inception, we've been partnering with holistic practitioners and outdoor adventure guides and companies to be able to curate these healing spaces. Um, so we're expanding that work by offering more nature-centered programming and content while we continue to build these relationships. So we've uh, partnered with an indigenous, black indigenous birder. Uh, as, as I mentioned, we started our work in New York and hosted women of color birding events in our uh, local parks. Uh, we've also partnered with uh, hike enthusiasts, uh, hike leaders to be able to offer a sort of nature-based therapy 101 experience where the uh, hikers were able to experience different types of nature-based therapy components during our, our hike. So we plan on expanding those type of programming. Um, we could not do the work that we do without 
partnerships and collaborations. Well, thank you. Um, really appreciate your thoughtful answers, um, everyone, for these questions. Um, before we open it up, um, I see we've got a couple questions in the chat coming through. Um, before we transition over those, I'm going to go through a really quick round of lightning questions, encourage our panelists um, to answer just really quickly. These are surprise questions. You all haven't seen these yet, um, but would just love to hear a little bit more about your personal um, stories and experiences on our local trails and parks. Um, so we'll go through, um, you can make these answers as quick as you want, um, but um, we'd love to hear from each of you in as few words um, as you'd like, if you have what your favorite local trail or park is, and this time we'll start with Lauren, favorite park or trail. Um, so I'm a runner, I think on Strava, it's called the Capital Crescent. It like goes up to Maryland. And I taught my friend how to ride a bike on that trail as well. <laughs> Amazing. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, over to you. Um, I actually live in the Hyattsville College Park area. And one of my favorite trail areas is the Lake Artemisia area, which connects into the Anacostia River Walk. Um, it is so beautiful. It's in front of the water, which has the, its own benefits. And um, I absolutely love bird watching, walking, roller skating, basically any sort of physical outdoor activity I will do at Lake Artemisia. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Sarita, over to you. I'm going to have to say Rock Creek because of the accessibility to um, downtown DC and also multi-use uh, they have it, paved trails, um, and so I, I like to see a lot of people of different abilities out there in nature. All right, going back up to the top, Lauren, back to you. Um, if you could bring one person um, that you already know or don't know yet um, out with you on a local trail, who would it be? Um, I think... I'll say my friend that I taught how to ride a bike. That was really fun. <laughs> awesome. Okay, over to you. She may or may not be in this call, but my mother. Um, and she's far, far away, but um, an offshoot of that, my grandmother, who is 93 and still walks basically every single day on her little island in the Philippines. Amazing. I'm going to have to invite Cameron, who's also another fibromyalgia warrior runner as well. So when we're both feeling physically up to it, I can't wait to share some miles with her. Thank you for sharing and thank you for responding to those unexpected questions, everyone. Um, Want to open it up to some questions we have in the chat. Um, and while I do that, I am just going to welcome our attendees. Um, I'll give you all um, voice access. So if you all have some questions you want to speak out loud, or if you just want to chat with the, the panelists here, I think we have a small enough group where um, would love to have um, an engaging conversation. So I'll pose the question, um, send it over to Kay. And while I'm doing that, um, invite folks um, to raise your hand. Um, and we'll be glad to, to welcome folks to speak directly with our panelists here. Um, while I'm doing that, I um, have a question for Kay here. Um, this individual is curious about what Kay shared on how words influence who participates in outdoor activities. Um, and they're wondering if you could share about any message testing that you've done or recommendations on how word, how we can word future events for community engagement. Great question. Um, we have done some message testing, starting with Urban Outdoors, actually. So we've been doing ongoing message testing for a long time. Some of that has been um, more organic through things like ads and um, email subject lines and things like that. Some of that has been direct to the interviewee or consumer. Um, one of the things that people said deter might be a strong word, but deters them from outdoor activities is really this idea that the outdoors is super intense and it has to be a super intense experience or else you are not, it's not an outdoor activity. So for example, we'll hear people or 
even organizations or influencers sometimes say that's not a real hike or that's not a real climb or if you aren't this type of hiker then are you even a hiker and i i can understand the humor behind statements like that but they can be really really alienating for people um so i would say the first thing that people express to us is really just like exclusionary type language like that. Um, I often get the question of like, what counts as an outdoor activity? And in my book, out an outdoor activity means that you are outside in the sun or the rain doing any activity. And so um, broadening our response to this idea of that doesn't count as a hike or that doesn't count as X activity um, is really like any activity can be an outdoor activity if you make it outdoors. And so we'll even do things, we'll we'll even host events at outdoor beer gardens or outdoor restaurants. We'll do picnics. Um, we'll have, we um, are co-hosting events with climbing gyms in the area, even though they're not outside, they are very much recreation focused. And so we are trying to, as a response to that, broaden the, the landscape of what counts as an outdoor activity. Um, the other piece of it that we heard a lot is jargon. People don't understand jargon if they are outdoor curious or if they're new to the outdoor industry. And what I mean by jargon is saying things like scrambling, um, saying things like spikes, crampons. Um, it can be gear. It can be lingo. Um, this is especially prevalent the more technical you get in activity. So um, cycling has its own jargon. Um, skiing, snowboarding has its own. Climbing has its own. And that the the overuse of jargony words without explanation or definition of what that uh that word means can be very alienating to people because instead of asking a lot of people will just be like I don't understand what that means I'm I'm out and so for us at Outerly we really make an effort in all of our copy and all of our messaging to avoid any sort of exclusionary language any sort of jargon and again leaning into this friendly idea um and thinking about, you know, if a friend came to me and I had no idea what I was about to get into, what kinds of words and what kinds of um, feelings would they need to include in their messaging in order to make it seem appealing to me? And we always think about it from that lens when we put new messages out. Um, I'll give an example of this really quickly. In the fall, when we were promoting some of our activities and things like that, we had a campaign called Nature Won't Ghost You. And uh, it's it's basically like, hey, you know, people might ghost you. Like a lot, we have a lot of people who complain about things like dating apps or getting ghosted on job applications. And so um, we're like, hey, we're putting this in your words, not ours. And so that type of relatable language resonates really nicely with people. People really liked our we had two little ghosts um, with the words like nature won't ghost you underneath it. And that was our get outside this fall campaign. And it was very successful. People really resonated with it. They enjoyed the, um, the imagery and the like pairing of words. And I think using phrases and language and, um, and feelings that exist already in these outdoor curious communities um, and then connecting nature into that actually helps to meet people where they are. So that's been our response. And that's been where we, that's where our hypothesis lies in how to make outdoor messaging more accessible to people. Thank you, Kay. Appreciate that. Um, we have another question here. Um, someone is wondering, did we see some parks and trails get disproportionately used while others remained empty during the pandemic when there was a surge of outdoor activities. Um, glad to turn to the panel on this one. Um, from my perspective and some of the information I've heard about the use of trail counters across the region is that during the pandemic, we saw some historic highs of usage um, on our trails, especially on some of those nice weekend days. Um, so we were setting regional highs on local trails I don't think, um, I don't know of any that were like significantly low, um, but we'll be glad to do more research into that. But I do know that we saw some very impressive high usage rates um, where, you know, thousands of people are using these segments of trails to get out, um, especially on 
um, those nice, nice weather days where people were excited to be outside. Um, would be glad to welcome anyone from the panel um, first, and then would be glad to offer anyone who is listening in to, to add to that response. Um, as I mentioned, I wasn't here during the pandemic, but anecdotally, I have heard that I heard similar to what you just said, Kelly, where we saw some really high trail usage as well. Thank you. I will offer a slightly different perspective, which mm -hmm. like Kelly is the expert in all things DC area trails. So I will leave the numbers and the observations to her, but um, one of the things that we noticed during the pandemic was, like I said earlier, an influx of usage of local trails. During the pandemic, uh, in addition to that observation, we also saw a lot of the national parks implementing traffic restricting measures so that they could, um, so that they could limit the number of people and the amount of over usage um, that was happening at the national parks. We, I, I think just off the top of my head, I know Acadia, um, Rocky Mountain, as well as some other national parks had increased um, advanced reservations that were required and things like that. And so um, I think that while we saw a, an increase locally, I think that that disproportionately affected places that are in the public spotlight, particularly national parks and national monuments that a lot of people know about. Um, and I think that's just because that was what was considered the outdoors for so long is these big bucket list type adventures outdoors. Um, and so I think from an overuse perspective, um, I would say the national parks, many of them, especially the more popular ones, got to the point of having to turn away visitors because they were so incredibly sought after during the pandemic. Thank you, Kay. Yeah, definitely an important perspective as we're thinking about like all of the potential outdoor experiences. I want to acknowledge um, Carmen, thank you for your comment here. Um, Carmen added that they're Kay's mom. Um, they think getting outdoors to meet others is very much needed by older individuals, especially those who are still working full-time jobs and struggle with making new friends outside of work. It's like very aligned to, to Kay's work and um, to the opportunities that Lauren and Sarita are working to make as well. Um, invite other folks if you'd like to share a comment um, about your own work or have a question for the panelists, please feel free to raise your hand or add it to the chat. All right. Um, go ahead, Michelle. Looks like you should be ready. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering if anyone has had experience engaging with um, healthcare systems, including hospitals and or clinics or FQHCs in promoting uh, getting outdoors and what that, ex and you know, if you did, then what led to some of the successes there? I can take it off. Um, this is part of our roadmap, so I don't have a lot of firsthand experience with um, outer lease, but um, I have previously worked in the health tech space, and I think one of the um, big burgeoning opportunities in healthcare is really this idea of um, more holistic, like whole person health. Um, and so instead of it just being like going to the doc, going to the clinic, getting a prescription diagnosis and then going home and following the instructions on the bottle. I think there's a lot of, a lot more focus on things like to Lauren's point, nutrition, um, things like um, social health, uh, mental health, et cetera. Um, and so one of the, I guess, big topics that we 
engage in on a regular basis is the connection of nature and mental health clinically and otherwise. Um, what I would say uh, from kind of an industry perspective is there are organizations that are doing this much more than I am. we are at Outerly. Um, one that comes to mind is an organization called Nature Dose. And um, following the legislation in a, a lot of other countries, um, Canada, the UK, and Japan uh, being on that list, um, they are actually working with providers who want to prescribe a certain amount of time in nature to their patients. And so what this, what their technology does is it can track how much time you've spent outside of a building or a um, indoor space. And um, they can actually report back to your providers um, how much time you've been spending. And so it's it's a great technology that's still developing, but um, incredible work by that team to incorporate prescribing nature into any patient's regimen. Thanks, Kay. That sounds like a, a very interesting app. Um, one organization that immediately comes to mind for me is called Park RX. Um, the organization is working with medical practitioners um, to think about how they can recommend um, getting outside. Um, did want to share with the group that something that the Capital Trails Coalition is looking forward to doing is collecting more of these resources. We know there is lots of research. There are lots of organizations. We have a great couple here represented, but tons more resources out there that we'd love to help um, collate and put in one place so that folks who are interested in leveraging some of the work that's already been done um, to advance our, our ongoing efforts here, um, I think it would be useful for the Capital Trails Coalition to help pull some of those resources together. So stay tuned for um, more of those resources to be um, worked on collaboratively by members of the coalition um, and then we'll post them online to make sure that folks can continue to pull from them. I would also like to add that um, sort of in the academic research space, uh, there is a more of a shift in looking at interventions that include community care, community partnerships, really addressing the roots of health, the root causes with upstream interventions versus downstream, which is more of like behavioral interventions. So you'll see more uh, health and hospital corporations speaking about public health as a social justice um, issue. Um, also creating opportunities to be able to partner with community-based organizations to be able and leverage those partnerships to be able to have more um, community-based movements, um, interventions. And so um, you may see more of that now with the talks of you know, certain localities. I know... Um, the District of Columbia and entities like New York State, New York City, really sort of trying to ad address public health disparities as a social justice issue. So you'll see more collaborations. Thank you. Yeah, so important. So much of this work is truly intersectional, um, how we think about our communities, um, public health, whether that's access to healthy foods, you know, accessible places, et cetera. A lot of things are connected. And like you said, um, the more we can work on those preventative measures, um, that definitely makes sense. And I think as we look at our communities, um, we know that there are currently inequities that we can be working to address. We have a couple minutes here. I um, wanted to, to throw it out if anybody has any additional questions. Well, um, I do want um, to send a deep heartfelt thank you to our panelists today. 
Thank you, Lauren, Kay, and Sarita for joining us. I'm really excited about the work that you are doing in very different ways, um, making our communities um, healthier, um, more accessible, more welcoming. Um, and I'm really excited to think about how resources like our trail networks um, can play a role in that work. Um, encourage our folks um, who have joined us online to send additional questions. Um, you can find the Capital Trails Coalition at capitaltrailscoalition.org. Um, welcome additional questions. We will be posting a recording of the session online. Um, so encourage you all to also reach out to each of these wonderful folks um, for more information about the work that they do. Um, so with that, I'm gonna close out with a, a round of applause. Um, 